Hi guys! Welcome to the final chapter of H2 Chem. So we're going to look at uh, an inorganic chem chapter on transition metals. Mm -hmm. So I think to start off first, uh, let's take a look at the D-block elements first. So Mr. Tim, can you run us through the electronic configuration of those? Hey, sure. So D-block elements, we're looking at this part of the periodic table, the D-block. Now, so if you look at the elements in the D-block, we're going from scandium all the way to zinc, and we are ranging from 21 electrons to 30 electrons. So there's this general format on how we can write the electronic configuration. Mm -hmm. It's a very simple AR, which is 18 electrons, and for S2, which is 2 electrons, so altogether that's 20, all right? So in other words, if you look at scandium, AR, and 4S2, titanium, AR, 4S2, that all corresponds to 20. So for scandium, 21 minus 20 is just one more extra electron that you put into your 3D orbital. Same thing for titanium, same thing for vanadium. Okay. okay, so mm. Mr. Tim, I think that takes up quite a lot of effort, right? So for yeah, all this quite. first row transition, uh, I mean D-block elements, right? Mm. Can you give me a shortcut for that? Yeah, of course, there's a faster method. Mm. So if you look at the second digit of all your number of electrons in the D-block, mm. right? You just tell yourself the second digit corresponds to the number of electrons in the 3D orbital. Okay, and that's a faster way to see it. So if I apply that to the rest here, there are two things that you got to take, two elements that you got to take note of. They are your chromium and they are your copper. Because if I do this for chromium, so again, second digit, which is 4, it ends up in my 3D orbital, 3D4, and you have 4S2 here, okay? And same thing for copper, second digit is a 9, so this goes to 3D9, then 4S2. Now, you would see that there's something a little bit tricky, right, Mr. Long? Mm. Because 3D4 and 3D9, it is so close mm. to a partially filled and a fully filled 3D orbital, right? So what would it do? Uh, so we're looking out for fully, uh, fully filled and half filled being mm. more stable than expected. Yep. So I think that they would like to uh, change up its configuration. Perhaps I think they would like to demote uh, 4S electron down to the 3D, ah. so that now they are either half filled or fully filled. Okay, so, so I'll still one. Yeah, go on, Mr. Yong. Yeah, so this will create a uh, very nice, uh, mm. more stable configuration, which we'll call this as the ground state configuration. Mm -hmm. Okay, so bear in mind that for this kind of configurations, uh, unfortunately, the square bracket AR uh, is not accepted in the exam. Uh, regardless of what they ask you, you have to put in starting from 1s2, 2s2, and so on and so forth. Mm. Okay, so in general, uh, the method that you brought about 21, 22, 23, the second digit of the proton number corresponding to the number of d electrons can only work uh, for first row transition, uh, for first row d block elements, scanty to zinc with the exception of chromium and copper. Yep. Okay? okay. Now, the next thing we're going to talk about is um, do, does that mean that every D block element is a transition metal? Mr. Tim, what do you think? Uh, then we can look at the definition. So, oh. if you look at how it's defined, right, a transition metal, right, is a D block element that forms one or more ions, stable mm. ions, okay, mm. with a partially filled D orbital. So, that means D0 or D10. Excuse me, partially filled, not D0. Not D10, excuse me. Okay. So um, when I look at this, hey, if I look yeah. at all the configuration, maybe scantium all the way until copper, right? Mm -hmm. All have uh, unpaired electrons. So okay. can I say that, oh, they are all um, uh, transition metals? No, no, no. So look at that. Look at the definition, Mr. Long. It's mm. forming an ion. Oh, right. Okay. So for scandium, it forms an ion of SC3+. plus. So I'm going to write here. If it's SC3+, plus, mm. right? So again, when you remove electrons from SC or scandium, you're going to remove electrons from the highest energy orbital. So you're removing from 4S, okay, and then and before. So if I remove three electrons, I remove two from 4S mm. and one from the 3D, mm. and that realize, you will realize that your 3D orbital is not completely empty. Mm. That's 3D0, right? So that is not considered as a transition metal. Okay. okay? And what about uh, zinc? Same idea. Mm. Now, Mr. Long, we should learn in sac 4. We should know this in sac 4. Zinc forms what ion? Uh, zinc 2 plus. Okay. So if you form zinc 2 plus, once again, I remove two electrons from the 4S orbital, mm. and notice how your 3D orbitals are all fully filled, right? There's no partially filled 3D orbital, because now you're at 3D10. So again, it does not obey a transition, the definition of a transition metal. Okay, so right. in conclusion, we can say that all D block are not necessarily transition metals. Mm -hmm. So for the context of first row D block elements, right, uh, only titanium all the way until copper can be considered as a transition metal. Scantium and zinc are not transition. Yes. Okay. Oh my gosh, Mr. Leong, look at the Dow Industrial Index. It's oh. going down, and I think it's going to eventually go back up, so I should buy now, right? Oh, wow. Tim, you must have uh, future eyes. Uh. How do you know that it will go up uh, eventually? I don't think it's something that's so predictable, right? Unless you're like a fortune teller. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's, it, that's, that's quite true. Can, can, we, can we get something that's more predictable then? Oh, sure. Then I think we should look at CAM. Because I think CAM is more predictable. There's this thing called periodic trends, right? Ah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, 
camp is definitely something easy, right? I mean, it's predictable. Not exactly. Some, uh, some teachers uh, claim it to be. So uh, how about this? Let's take a look at the atomic properties, right? And these are all periodic trends, which means that there is some uh, some sort of a prediction. You are able mm -hmm. to see the trends uh, very nicely, okay? So uh, first things first, what are atomic properties? In the syllabus, there's going to be three different uh, properties that you must learn. Uh, there will be the radius, okay? Whether it's atomic or ionic. Uh, the next is your ionization energy. Uh, the last one is called your electronegativity. Okay, now these three factors are all mainly governed by this one very important principle, mm -hmm. uh, which is known as this thing called the effective nuclear charge. Uh, Mr. Tim, what do you understand by this term then? Well, the effective nuclear charge is just the attraction from the nucleus mm. to the valence electrons, right? How strong the attraction is. Yes, yeah. so these are electrostatic attractions, right? Mm. So uh, these, uh, these attractions actually depend on two major factors. Okay. Uh, the first of which is the nuclear charge. Right. Uh, what does nuclear charge depend on? Well, number of protons in the mm -hmm. nucleus. Yeah. And the second one is called the shooting effect. What is mm. that? So I'm going to, shooting effect is the number of electrons that shoot your valence electrons from mm. the nucleus. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, that is dependent on the number of inner field shells. The mm. more they are, the stronger the shooting effect. Yes. So we're going to see something that we have seen before, which is in periodic table. Uh, if you look across period 2 or period 3, uh, let's just recall a bit uh, about the trends. Uh, as we move across the period, the nuclear charge increases because the number of protons increase. Mm -hmm. But for the shooting effect, they remain relatively constant. Uh, the reason why is because the number of inner field shells remains the same. So overall, the effective nuclear charge is going to increase. And let's take a look at how that actually affects my atomic properties. Uh, first of which, you are going to get, uh, you realize that the ENC increases, which means that there's stronger attraction between the nucleus and the valence electrons. Mm -hmm. So that means that the IE will be increasing. It's going to make it a little bit more difficult for you to remove the electrons, right? Mm. Uh, how about the radii? Well, if the overall attraction from the nucleus to the electrons becomes stronger, then I'll be squeezing those electrons tighter to myself, right? So the radar should decrease. All right. Yeah. And the last one is electronegativity, which refers to how strongly you attract bonding electrons in a covalent bond. Mm -hmm. uh, in this case, your EN will definitely increase as well. For sure. For sure. Uh, Mr. Tim, can you help me to translate this into transition metals then? Yeah, so transition metals, the idea is still quite similar. So again, going across the period, you, are, you have increasing number of protons. So again, from P to P plus 1. And of course, this would result in an increase in nuclear charge, mm -hmm. okay? But here's the thing that's a little bit tricky, right, Mr. Leong? Because mm -hmm. when we add in new electrons going across the period, do we add it into the 4s orbital? Uh, no, those are completely filled. <laughs> exactly. So we are going to go into the penultimate shell, mm -hmm. which is the second to the last shell, that is your 3d orbitals. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you will see going across the period, you are adding in more electrons into your 3d or electrons, which means you're adding in more shooting electrons. Your SE shooting effect will definitely go up. So of mm. course, if NC goes up, SC goes up and you subtract them, then your ENC would remain relatively invariant. So we're going to use a bar to represent that. Yeah. So it means that throughout the transition metals, you realize that the ENC are roughly the same. Mm -hmm. Okay. How does that translate in terms of the atomic properties then? Well, that would mean that IE, radii, and EN, they all kind of remain relatively invariant. Okay, yeah. that's great. There but if go. I take a look at the graph over here, right? Yeah. Uh, you start to realize that for <gasps> atomic radii, uh, mm. the number actually, uh, or rather the, the radii actually decreases oh, no. slightly. Mm. Um, I can still say that it's relatively invariant, right? Yeah. But actually, it still decreases slightly, which bit. simply means that actually the ENC does not also remain so, um, uh, so, so uh, invariant. There is mm -hmm. actually a small increase in the ENC. Uh, but for general purposes, we can just say that they are re re remaining relatively invariant. Okay, that's good, that's good. Okay, so the last of which is looking at physical properties, mm -hmm. right? And uh, usually they will want you to compare this against the S-block elements, right? In the syllabus, there are two physical properties you must pay attention to. Yeah. They are my melting point as well as the density. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Mr. Tim, can you ask you a bit more about the melting point? Yeah, sure. So to understand the melting point of metals, you first need to understand the structure of a metal, right? Which is a giant metallic lattice. You have that lattice of positively charged cations, right? Surrounded by a sea of delocalized electrons. Mm -hmm. And of course, if you want to look at what affects a metallic bond shrink, it is basically the strength of the electrostatic attraction between the cation, right, mm -hmm. and the C of the localized electrons, which is proportional to charge density. So it is the charge of the cation over the radius of the cation. That's okay? right. Now, if I take a look at the trends uh, of transition metal yeah. uh, me melting points against the S block, mm -hmm. so transition metals, if I take a look, uh, it starts from titanium mm -hmm. all the way to copper, right? Mm -hmm. we, we eliminate the scandium and zinc because they're not transitional. Yes. Uh, so these numbers, the melting points are definitely much higher to their counter block uh, S block. Uh, so their copper, sorry, your uh, potassium and your calcium, mm -hmm. the melting points are much lower. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, why is that so, Mr. Tim? Well, again, this back, back to the whole idea of charge density, right? So for potassium and calcium, you're going to be using your number of electrons in your valence orbital, so your 4s2, your 4s1, right? You'll be delocalizing them, and that will be your charge. So for potassium, maybe plus one. 
calcium will be plus two. But Mr. Long, for mm. titanium all the way to copper, mm. are you just delocalizing the 4S electrons? Uh, I thought that we were just only going for valence, right? Yeah, but you don't, right? Because in transition metals, remember how your 4S and your 3D electrons are very close in energy, okay. right? So you, can, you are able to use both of them to delocalize into the sea of delocalized electrons. That means for your transition elements here, your charge for Q will be a lot higher than in the S block. Okay? okay. That's it. So in general, that means that if you can delocalize more electrons, you're going to have stronger electrostatic attraction. Mm -hmm. And as a result, it correlates to stronger metallic bond strength. And That's of right. course, the melting point will be higher than the S-log elements. Yes. The next of which is going to be looking at the density, right? So first things first, Mr. Tim, can you run me through in physics density, what's the formula that you normally use? Well, mass over volume. Okay, right? yeah. so we're going to uh, do a bit of a, a, a microscopic picture. We're going to take a look at the atoms themselves. Now, if I take a look at transition metals and I compare it against the corresponding S block, mm -hmm. how do you think the, uh, the mass of these transition metals will be like? Well, the mass should be higher because you're going across the period, right? Mm. MR goes up. Okay, for so sure. more protons, definitely the mass will be higher as well. Definitely. So for transition metals, their atomic mass is larger, mm -hmm. right? Uh, but if I take a look at the volume, you see the half, what does it mean to be the volume of an atom? So mm -hmm. we're going to take a look specifically at the atomic uh, radius. Mm -hmm. So how does the atomic radius compare against the, trans, uh, against the S block elements? Well, remember we saw just now, the atomic radius. Mm. So going across the period, yes, we did say that the effective nuclear charge remains relatively invariant, but increases a little bit. So this results in a slight, small little decrease in atomic radius, mm -hmm. which means the D-block elements, right, or the transition metal elements, they have a smaller radius than your S-block. Okay. okay, so if I take a look at the formula now, uh, yeah. if you go back to the densities formula, okay. uh, the mass of transition metals are higher, yep. but the volume is actually uh, lower, mm -hmm. right? So as a result, your density is going to be higher as compared to your uh, S-block elements. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. this is the trend that you must remember. Always compare it against the S-block elements. All right, guys, so no more physical properties. We are done with that. We're going to move on into chemical properties, and we have four of them, okay? So the first one, variable oxidation state, we're going to be covering in this video, and the next three, we'll be doing in the next, okay? So this first property, uh, the first thing to understand is what is an oxidation state. So in very layman's term, it refers to the number of electrons that you use for bonding. Mm -hmm. uh, whether it's an ionic or covalent, it is still the same idea, okay? The number gives you an indication on how many electrons are being used, mm -hmm. okay? Now, for transition metals, turns out uh, the elements can form variable oxidation states. So if I give you, if you look at this table over here, we first focus on scandium and zinc first. Earlier, mm -hmm. we proved to you that it is not a transition metal, and that is why they both only exhibit one oxidation state. Okay, there is no variable number. So those that have variable number are from titanium all the way to copper. And you notice that um, there seems to be a trend in terms of the maximum oxidation state. Uh, there is this, like, this rightward arrow looking thing, right? Uh, it looks like there are certain trends over here. Uh, Mr. Tim, can you remind us why is there such a trend? Yeah, sure. So for your transition metals, right, mm -hmm. when they lose electrons to form bonds, not only do, will they be using their 4S, they will be using their 4S electrons and the number of unpaired electrons in their 3D orbital. So if you look at titanium, you have two electrons in the 3D orbital that is unpaired and two in the 4S, which means your max OS is plus four, okay? Let's do one more together. If you look at manganese, right, you have five unpaired 3D electrons and two electrons in the 4S, add them together, and that will be your maximum OS. Now, because they are transition metal elements, they would exhibit multiple oxidation states. So for manganese, it would be plus one, all the way to the max OS, all right, plus seven. Okay. So this trend is very easy, right? To yeah. get the maximum OS, you simply look out for how many 4S do you have, mm -hmm. as well as the number of unpaired 3D. Mm. Uh, unfortunately, this rule doesn't quite work for uh, copper. So uh, the one you just have to pay attention that for copper, it follows the trend, the maximum can, can go up to plus three, which is not a very common oxidation state anyways. Okay. okay. All right. So Mr. Leong, we're going to talk about Enoch values and redox reactions now. And okay. um, before we start, I'm going to throw you a question, okay? So say I have a beaker mm. of I minus, mm. right? A beaker of I minus, and I'm going to pour in Fe2 plus mm -hmm. into it. Now, can you tell me, without going to laboratory, mm. will there be a reaction? So I think I'll use concepts from electrochem, right? Okay. We have to use this thing called the E cell value, which is applicable for all redox reactions. Mm -hmm. uh, I understood from last time that E cell, if it's positive, it is a spontaneous re uh, process, which corresponds to a negative delta G. Mm -hmm. And of course, vice versa is true. And how do we calculate the E cell value is using this formula called E reduced minus E oxidized. So I think my first step is to observe hey, who is getting oxidized, who is getting reduced. Okay. So if I take a look at I minus, right, Mr. Mm -hmm. Tim, uh, does I minus undergo oxidation or reduction? Huh? Well, you start off with the bigger with I minus. So I minus in your half equation, he's always on the right hand side, 
which means there's only one way he can go, right? And that is literally to the left, which means I minus must be oxidized. Okay. okay, so we determine that, and that will mean that the Fe2 plus is going to get reduced, definitely. It has to be. It has so to be. when I choose out the equation, I have to be very cautious, mm. right? Because my Fe2 plus, it can undergo oxidation or reduction. So I've copied out two different reactions. Obviously, you can't have two uh, species undergoing oxidation, right? It doesn't make sense. So therefore, when you choose it out, you have to be careful. You have to use the one that has negative 0 0.44, mm -hmm. okay? So that will be the E reduced, and the other one will just be the E oxidized. Now, when I take a look at these two values and I plug it in into the E-cell formula, what value would you get, Mr. Tim? Well, I just plug it into the E-cell, yeah? So mm -hmm. E-cell equals to ER minus EO. Mm -hmm. So negative 0 0.44 minus plus 0 0.54, 0, negative 0 0.99. The E-cell value is negative. That mm -hmm. means delta G is more than zero, right? It's a not a spontaneous reaction. Yes. Nothing will happen. So nothing will happen. That mm. value is smaller than zero, yeah. right? So once again, one of the careless mistakes is some of you may just simply take the bigger number minus away the smaller number. Okay, that is not true. Huh? You always first need to identify who is getting oxidized and who is getting reduced based mm. on the original reactants that's inside the species. Yes. So the strategy is very different from electrochemical cell, right? This is not talking about any electricity going on. It's simply just a redox reaction in a beaker. Yes. Bye! Bye.